uh, actually ends up being pretty good, good fishing up there. The, uh, you know, the one thing, uh, a lot of times I, I end up being, being very, uh, talking about, uh, the Kentucky government and things we do good and we do bad. One of the things we do really good is stocking our lakes. Uh, and if you go up to prisoner's lake these days, uh, you can actually find rainbow trout that you can fish for in Prisoner's Lake. Every twice a year, the Department of Fish and Game come up and put in a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, probably 1,200, 1,200 or so, so uh, fish, uh, trout into that lake. So uh, if you get a chance before we get going on this thing, make sure that you take your rod and reel up to, uh, up to Prisoner's Lake. It's actually some good fishing. Um, several lakes around here actually have, uh, have rainbow trout in them, but since we're talking about prisoners, the bottomless lake, uh, we'll do that. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, is it really bottomless? So, hey, I see Sherry Otten's on there, Mark Koenig, Rick Wilkie, good to see you. I see a couple other folks that uh, have joined, but their names aren't showing up on my screen, so welcome everybody. We've got a few minutes before we're going to actually start and go into this thing. They, they, they're going to give a lovely introduction of me that I think I wrote. Uh, so um, you'll be very impressed. It's, it'll show you my good writing skills. It'll make you believe I'm, I'm somebody I'm not. So the purpose of fiction, right? Is everybody, is everybody part of cocktail for themselves to enjoy this? Because, I mean, I think that's what we have to do when we talk about, about uh, Prisoner's Lake and fishing. So cheers as we... As we move into this. Also, welcome to those joining up on Facebook. I don't know. Do you do it? Oh, recording is in progress. We'll be beginning in about one more minute, just so some more people can come in. Um, but thank you, everyone, for joining. Very much so. Thanks for everybody for being here and enjoying the true story, true story of the alligators of Prisoner's Lake and how Prisoner's Lake came to have two Florida Everglade alligators come to reside in its watery confines. Okay, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Northern Kentucky History Hour. I'm your host for tonight, Heather Cook. Northern, His Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of Barringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. Barringer Crawford Museum is supported in part by the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol, Carol Ann Ralph V. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining for access to discounts and exclusive programming. Learn more and join at bcmuseum.org. Um, before we begin, let's go over a few reminders. Everyone's microphone has been muted so we can all focus on the presentation. Feel free to turn off your video if you prefer. Otherwise, others on the call are able to see you even when the screen is being shared. If you have a question or comment to share, please type it in the chat feature and we will try to get to as many questions as possible immediately following the presentation. Um, also, there will be a quiz question tonight. The first respondent to um, enter a correct answer in the chat wins a Northern Kentucky History Hour pin. And let's meet tonight. And a, and a copy, and a copy of Alligator Alley. I'll drop it by the museum. So if uh, anybody gets this question uh, that I'm going to ask here in a minute, we'll also give you an autographed copy of uh, Alligator Alley. Again, you can pick it up at the library. Yeah, so the, at the library, at the museum. 
the prize is even greater tonight, a Northern Kentucky History Hour pin and a copy of the book. Um, so let's meet our speaker tonight. Um, Rick Robinson has traveled to New York, Los Angeles, Paris, and London to receive awards for his political thrillers. But it is a novel depicting um, it is a novel depicting reflections on a childhood in Ludlow and Bromley, the Twin Cities. He says, which Robinson calls his defining work. A graduate of Ludlow High School, Eastern Kentucky University, and Chase College of Law. He and his wife, Linda, live in northern Kentucky. He fishes at Prisoner's Lake on a regular basis. Rick, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Thanks to everybody for joining this. This is such a, a, a fun topic for me hey. uh, because it does involve my great uncle. It does involve a lot of things that, it, that is uh, part of our family lore. And the fun thing about it is it involves the book I wrote that is ba based in large part came about because of this true story of how alligators ended up in Prisoner's Lake. Now, before we get going, uh, we do have a trivia question. A little bit of a trick. If you've read the book already, you probably know this, but what indigenous, this, is, this all takes place on a seminal Indian reservation uh, down in Grand Cypress, down in uh, the lower Everglades. Does anybody know what the indigenous tribe, the Seminoles were? Who were the Seminole? Uh, if you want to put that in the chat, the first person to put that in the chat that can figure that one out. Yes, it is a trick question. Uh, there are Seminole Indians today, but they were not an indigenous tribe. So if you can figure that out and you can put that into the chat, first one to do that, it's one of our pens and also gets one of our uh, a free copy of Alligator Alley. So, this is, uh, again, something that's very particular to me, and I, and I love this story, and it was a story that, that I had been told my entire life, and in fact, I remember mentioning this story one day to um, Lori at the Beringer Crawford Museum, and her having doubts about it actually having happened. She said, oh, come on, there were never alligators up at the Beringer Crawford Museum. They never made their way into alligator, down into Prisoner's Lake. And I, I was actually able, as I was writing Alligator Alley, to come up with the newspaper articles of when the alligators got into the lake and how they were captured. And this is going to be a little disjointed at the beginning because this story has many, many different beginnings. Um, now, the first beginning of Prisoner's Lake starts with what probably everybody knows, and that is it started out as a rock quarry. I know until I started doing the research for the book and, 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 and taking a look at this, I never really knew what the quarry was for. And so begin, again, we have many beginnings in this story. The first beginning is this one, the beginning of the quarry. So it's in uh, 1916, and the city of Covington needs a lot of rock to go out and start repairing the roads and start doing things in the, in the city. And they decide, they, they, they cut a deal with the DeVue family, who still owned DeVue Park at that time, that was still the family area. And they go down to where Prisoner's Lake is today. Uh, put in a couple uh, mills and some quarry, quarry rock or crushing machines and do all the things that they do and take prisoners from the Kenton County Jail every day up to DeVu Park, where Prisoner's Lake is, to start digging rock in the quarry. Now, there were a couple problems with this. Uh, first of all, every time they sent a couple groups, dozen groups of, of prisoners up there, they only sent them with one guard. So they would go up with 30 or 40 prisoners. They'd come back with 20. It became very quickly known that every, this was the easiest way to escape jail in Kenton County was to get on the work crew uh, to work in the quarry at Davout Park. You would suddenly disappear and never be, be, be seen again. The, the other thing that, that happened is they thought that this would be a great way to save money for the city of Covington. Turns out it ends up being a huge loss. 
So they shut down the quarry. Now here's one that I'll actually put out there and I'll look on the chat in a minute if anybody ever knows the answer to this one. The one quick thing I don't know about Prisoner's Lake is how did it start to fill? Because you think about this idea, they're building this rock quarry, they're digging down, they're digging out this rock. Uh, was it natural streams that suddenly brought it in? What, you know, did they hit a spring? Did they hit something along the way? I had to believe somewhere when they were doing this, they hit a spring and somewhere that was what started filling up Prisoner's Lake and probably also led to its demise as that. But if anybody knows that, put that, put that uh, answer in the chat because uh, that's, that's the one thing I don't ever, I've never really figured out the full story on. Uh, and as you go through, let's digress a little bit because uh, for anybody who's, who's my age or uh, are even a lot younger or older, remember a lot of legends about Prisoner's Lake. Uh, alligator, the alligators may be the only one that's true, but you know, first off, it's referred to even, I was up there fishing the other day and a young man was telling his wife or girlfriend as they were, as they were fishing of, you know, this is a bottomless lake. So it got the, 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 the whole idea of the bottomless lake because when, when I was a kid, uh, there was somebody who was committed a murder in Covington and was said to have tossed the gun, the weapon, into the lake. And they had to send out divers to see if they could find this gun somewhere in Prisoner's Lake. And this is actually something I found from the archives in, at the Kenton County Library. These are the, the divers coming out. And the urban legend was, was that they could never find the bottom, they, that it was a bottomless lake. They found a lot of things. They said there were, there were mob cars from the days of Newport uh, and all of the gambling that they had at the lookout house in Kenton County that, you know, there had been some, uh, uh, some hits where they had driven, you know, driven people into there, uh, that there were catfish the size of, of human beings that they saw when they were down there. I don't remember if they ever really found the gun or not, uh, but that was kind of all the legend that we grew up with. Now, Here's the big question. Anybody know how really deep Prisoner's Lake is? And again, rhetorical question because we're going to the chat, but I'll answer that. According to the state wildlife, it's only 26 feet deep. Now, pretty good deep for the acreage that it covers, but certainly not the bottomless lake that we grew up believing that it was. Uh, and especially, I think, because of all the all the lore that went around. Uh, again, the particular this particular picture of the of the divers coming back up, <clears throat> and I think they must have just been out there on a murky day where they couldn't find it necessarily or something to step on on the bottom. I do believe that there are probably some pretty big catfish down at the bottom of it. I've seen them pull a bunch of big ones out of there when I've been up there fishing, uh, but I don't know that they were the size of human beings. Uh, and whether there are cars in there still, who knows. But that brings to my story about Prisoner's Lake. And my story about Prisoner's Lake begins with these two guys that you see on this picture. Uh, the guy, as you're looking at the screen, the guy on the right in the glasses is my uncle Chip Thompson. Lived down in Bromley uh, on Roman Avenue. And the guy on the left is Rudy Gaither. Now, for those of you who know Tom and Bill Gaither, the, the wonderful artists from both artists from Northern Kentucky, uh, Bill deceased as of a couple of years ago, Tom still painting away down at his studio down in Ludlow. That's, uh, that's their pop. And if anybody ever goes down to Harrington Lake, that's actually one of the, one of the halls they had of fish they brought in. They were constant down at Harrington Lake which actually was the intro to the story of how my uncle became the, the part of this book. My uncle, Chip Thompson, absolutely loved to fish. Fishing was his life. Nothing else depended on it. And he and Rudy would go down every weekend to Lake Harrington. Every chance they got, they would go down to Lake Harrington and they would fish. They even had a little cabin down there. Well, Somewhere along the way one night, and no one's quite sure what happened or whether or not there was alcohol involved, uh, but the cabin burned down. 
And when Chip got back and told his wife that, you know, he was going to have to spend more time down at the lake because he was going to have to rebuild this cabin. Uh, Chip's wife said to him, you got to make up your mind. It's near the fish. So Chip took everything that he had, threw it in the back of the army Jeep that he had at the time, jumped in the Jeep and drove to the Everglades where he finished the drive on Cypress Reservation and lived the rest of his life on the reservation with the Seminole Indian tribe that is located on, uh, on Cyprus. Apparently that night, my, my, my great aunt called, uh, called Rudy Gaither and said, uh, have you seen Chip? He said, no, I haven't seen Chip since we were, got back from Harrington. Why? Well, I told him it's either me or the fish, to which Rudy replied, well, what the hell did you tell him that for? You knew what he was going to choose. And he headed, off, of course, then down to, uh, down to the Everglades. And that's where, tell you a little bit how, but that's where my story begins with, with this. Because this guy, for me, was one of the, you know, I was a, a kid, him coming back, or I see in him in Florida, he was just this, this giant of a figure that, had, that, you know, lived in the Everglades, lived with an Indian tribe, the wrestled alligators for all we knew. Uh, also bought me my first guitar. You see the mandolins hanging behind me here. Uh, Chip could play anything, but he bought me my first guitar when I was probably five years old uh, and brought me brought me an axe that I, that I don't think I ever learned to play, but I always kept it around. So the story kind of begins there, but it also has a second beginning. And the story, the story for me begins, as I tell this, on September 24th, 1975. Uh, and on that given day, my life was forever changed. Uh, the, as you see from the notes, the Northern Kentucky Education Association was having a conference at the old drawbridge. Uh, I think at the town, if you look at this, I think it was even the round towner at the time. Oh no, they got it already gone. Well, yeah, they're down at the bottom, it was still the round towner. That'll tell you how long ago it was. Uh, you have to be you have a certain amount of gray hair to remember the word, the round towner. And so my job that day as a 17 year old from Ludlow High School was to stand at Jesse Stewart's side and get him for throughout the day, whatever he wanted. He was sitting there chain smoking cigarettes, uh, grab him a, um, you know, grab him a cup of coffee, grab him whatever, you know, he would want to get his lunch for him, whatever. Jesse Stewart wanted was, was, was my responsibility. Now, I was a huge, huge Jesse Stewart fan. Uh, this was a guy from W. Holler down, uh, down the AA highway. Didn't exist then, but down the AA highway today, right off the AA is W. Holler. And, you know, he had written Pulitzer Prize nominated novels, um, High to the Hunter, um, um, Taps for Private Tussie, these great short books of short stories. This is actually a book that he gave to me for the day and the notes from his speech that he gave. Uh, and he gave it to me because he said, this was a book of short stories that was out of, out of publication. I wanted to buy Hyde of the Hunter and he goes, oh, that'll, they'll print that one forever. Buy these short stories. Uh, this will be, <laughs> be a limited edition book. So there'll never be any more of these. And so I, I have this as one of my prized possessions of that day. But spending that day with Jesse Stewart, I knew at that moment, as I sat there with, uh, with the old man and, and he was telling his stories and he was doing his lecture to the Northern Kentucky Education Association, I knew I wanted to write the great American novel. I wanted to write something of it. He wrote about coming of age in in the mountains of Eastern Kentucky, I wanted to write something about coming of age in the river cities of Northern Kentucky. Uh, there was one problem at the time, I was 17 years old. Uh, you know, not much to write about coming of age when you haven't come of age yet. In fact, that's one of the jokes about, my kids always tell when I talk about this book because of, they always say, dad wanted to write a coming of age book and he couldn't do it until he reached his fifties. Uh, Yes, it did take me that long to come of age. But that's the whole background of how I actually got interested in writing. 
and how, you know, was, was part of, you know, such a fabric of what I wanted to do. And so over the years, I would sit down with this book and I would write this idea of a man traveling down to the upper keys or somewhere down in South Florida, and then trying to go out to the, to the Cypress reservation to see if he could find any remnants or memories or something that would stir his soul that had given a rise to his great uncle. And I could never get past his second chapter. Uh, and I, and I think that's probably in large part because I, I, I didn't know still for 30 some years, what, uh, what, what I, when I was going to come of age. Another beginning of this book begins for me, fast forwarding 30 years, uh, when I do become a published author. And I published my first book called, uh, uh, with, with Headline Books, they've uh, been a wonderful publisher for me. I want to give a shout out to them for uh, taking a risk on me 15 years ago. Uh, but I, I had gone to a ball game with a buddy of mine, Tom Salinger. Uh, many of you may know him as a banker down in Covington. And I told Tom about this whole idea of how I wanted to write this coming of age novel about my great uncle. I told him the story of the, you know, leaving, being told it's me or the fish, he took off and I had this idea. And he looks at me and he goes, you know, it had to be a nice book, but you've got so many political stories of the times that you've been involved in politics and the things you did when you were working with Senator Bunning and, and the different campaigns that you worked on. What you ought to write is a political thriller. And that really resonated with me. And so I went home and started writing probably that same night, if not within the week, uh, my first book. And it was called The Maximum Contribution. And I wrote it truthfully as, I don't want to say a lark, uh, but I wrote it in the fact that I was going to write it, uh, have it edited, and then run it off a couple, you know, 100 copies and give it to my, you know, 100, 100 unsuspecting friends who would get it as their, uh, as their Christmas present. Now, I take this and I, I, I finish the book, and many of you on this call know my wife, Linda, uh, I gave it to my wife, Linda, to take a look at. She paid me the ultimate wife compliment. After reading it, she said, you know, this isn't half bad. And she said, you know, instead of running it off and spending the money, I bet we could get somebody to publish this. Pshaw, I, you know, I, I couldn't imagine that the writings of a kid from Ludlow, Kentucky, were somehow going to get published. But I agreed because I knew eventually I was going to come back and say, I need $1,500 out of our budget to run a bunch of copies off for myself. Uh, as it turns out, we make a long story very short. We ended up having uh, three different publishing houses uh, bargain over the book. And I ended up with uh, the person I've been with ever since, Kathy Teets from Headline Books, who has uh, been very, very kind to my writing career and the best fan my writing career has ever had. Uh, we're up to 12 books. The new one will be out at Christmas time. Uh, and again, I have nothing to do with this. So you look at that and go, okay, how then did you end up getting this whole idea of writing about alligators? Well, I still had this idea in my head. And, and as I became a writer, and as I got through the first two or three books, things started clicking with me about what this coming of age book would be about. And it came about because I started having children who were growing up into this age of millennials. And I suddenly thought of the way that they were treating life and looking at life. Um, maybe my uncle Chip was the original millennial uh, that he went chasing after his dream, despite every, what everybody thought was wrong and bad. And, and so the whole idea of the book becomes an idea of at age 50, uh, a, a, a guy going through the process of, of self-evaluation and trying to figure out if he's really successful or if he's just living a facade of a life and that people like his uncle were the, his great uncle in this book called Gator um, is really the one who has shown success and really the one who is, is 
the person we should all look about the whole idea of being, you know, and and I, I think I think it's a the book itself ends up being a a a succession ge <clears throat> generational type of thing where you know my parents, my dad, success was working 30 years for the same company, same business, getting a gold watch at the end and a defined benefit program. Uh, my generation comes along and we skip jobs and jobs and jobs moving up corporate ladders. I remember in 10 years, I had worked at a law firm. I had worked at a, well, in Capitol Hill with Jim Bunning. And then I went for, I went to work for the, one of the, uh, you know, the oldest law firm in greater Cincinnati. And this is like over a 12 year period. And my father having a discussion with me about, he was concerned that I couldn't hold down a job. So, you know, and then you go to today's generation that I'm looking at my old children, my own children grow up and they look and they see so much about personal satisfaction of what it is they're doing, uh, becoming so much more key to their career. Uh, and you look at all of that and you say, okay, which one of those three generations were really successful? And that's what this guy in the book, James Conrad, is actually going through. That's what's permeating uh, this whole thing as he goes and searches to see if he can find where the reservation was that that his great uncle lived and 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 what this was all about. Um, it's got wonderful reviews. It's won a couple of awards. Um, if uh, if you if you find yourself in that time frame uh, with, when you have the great, I, I call this part of a series of coming of age novels for people with gray hair who never came of age. So, if you find yourself in that category and you want to read it, uh, feel free to go to Amazon and get a copy. Uh, run down. Uh, uh, they have copies down at the library. They also have copies down at the uh, the bookstore down at the uh, down at the Rebley bookstore. But the <clears throat> the whole again the whole concept revolved around that. But in the middle of it, I began doing a lot of research about my uncle Chip uh, and what was family lore and what was truth. And the, I, my, I had heard people in the family talking for years about the alligators of Prisoner's Lake. And this story and that story, I finally started asking family members and also Bill and Tom Gaither, tell me more, tell me more about this. Tell me more about this. And it turns out that the story of the alligators of Prisoner's Lake really is true. Uh, and here's how it happened. Chip was uh, living down in the Everglades, uh, living on a houseboat in the Everglades on, a, on the, on the uh, Cypress Reservation and had been accepted by the Seminole tribe. Uh, as as one of their own, he was doing uh, fishing and uh, and big and game hunting as a guide while he was down there. He was also doing taxidermy work while he was down there. I know he knew that, uh, and um, Heather will have have to help me here. I can't remember if it was Beringer or Crawford, but I believe it was uh, Mr. Crawford that he knew very well. And some of the animals that we may have seen growing up. Uh, during that time frame may have actually been taxidermied by by Uncle Chip as he uh, would come back on some of his uh, adventures. But one time he would come to town and he would he would always, you know, it was always a big deal. He would always bring Indian River oranges and all of these great stories that he would bring with him. Well, one time he brought something else. Uh, he brought back to him two alligators. And the alligators were for the Gaither boys. The Gaithers lived on Carneal Street down in Ludlow. And so he brought them as pets uh, to alligators. Rudy was his best fishing buddy, and he thought it would be something for, for Bill and Tom to have, I don't know why, two alligators in the backyard. And so they dig a pit in the back of the Gaither house at Carneal Street and put these two alligators into the pit. Uh, Tom, I think, told me one time that they were charging a nickel apiece uh, for all the kids in Ludlow to come by and see the alligators 
that were in the backyard, the alligators at that point of Ludlow. And then as family stories go, uh, the alligators started to grow a little bigger than they should be over the summer. And apparently when one of the alligators, Mrs. Gaither was pushing one of the alligators back into the, into the pit with her best broom and the alligator bit the broom handle in half. Uh, that was the last straw of the alligators being at the Gaither household. And so um, Mr. Crawford, um, Mr. Gaither and Uncle Chip decided they would give the alligators to the Berenger Crawford Museum and they would build a special display outside where people could come and see these two alligators. Well, they take the alligators up to uh, make temporary pins for them as they're building the permanent cage. And they come up one day to finish off the cages and the alligators are gone, not to be found. So everybody kind of figures, okay, somebody has come and stolen the alligators uh, as a just as a, a manner to either get some alligator tail for uh, for to put on the grill or to get some leather to make some boots out of, but everybody figures that's just what happened to them. And everybody goes up on their way. Several days later, the police show up looking for uh, my uncle Chippy at my grandma's house. And what had apparently happened was that the alligators had nosed their way out of the chicken wire and had began uh, walking around the golf course at Davu Park, scaring the golfers, and also made their way through one of the Wednesday night concerts. In the, if you, you read the history of Davu Park up at the Banshell, uh, they used to have concerts on Wednesday nights. And these two alligators decided if there's a party, they needed to be there. And the alligators make their way through the party, people scurrying in all directions. Uh, and uh, the police show, they start asking around of going, where are these gators from? And the fingers all start pointing at my uncle Chip. So they show up at grandma's house and they put him in the back of the police car and they said, you're gonna go catch these alligators. He said, well, stop on the way, I gotta get my buddy. I got to get my buddy Rudy Gaither with me. So he and Rudy go up and decide that they're going to catch the two alligators who have now found a home in Prisoner's Lake. Swimming around, you can see their noses. Uh, it's the, my dad was actually there uh, when it happened and was telling me about it. Word had gotten out, there was actually a, an article in the, uh, in the Time Star, I believe it was at the time, the Kentucky Post Time Star, about the alligators being loose in Prisoner's Lake and that there would be a rescue attempt of these alligators on whatever date it was. And my pop said there must have been 150 people lining the shore of Prisoner's Lake, everybody waiting to see uh, if they were going to catch, if these alligators really existed or and if they could be caught. So Uncle Chip goes out in a canoe and one at a time, lures them to the top with some chicken bones and some chicken. And on the shore, Rudy is standing there with a very solid uh, fishing pole. And when the alligator would come up, Chip would hook a treble hook underneath the alligator's shoulder. Now it's Rudy's job to now get the alligator in. At the time, there was this fishing equipment that was the the rods were square I, w I wish uh i wish bill was still still alive bill remembered the name of the company i think i actually put it in the book uh but the 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 rods instead of being circular as they are today were square and there was a picture in the paper of rudy pulling that alligator in and the real bent all the way over as he was getting it or the, or the rod built bent all the way over as he was getting the the alligator close to the shore ever ever the entrepreneur rudy sent the picture to the to the fishing company and uh, according to tom and bill every year the fishing company would send him a whole batch of new equipment to use that picture in an advertisement that they would say uh, that their fishing rod 
were strong enough to catch alligators in Kentucky. Uh, so they get the alligators in. They, 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 now there's some question as to whether they got both of them. I've actually read somewhere along the line that they only got one of them and then the other one was captured by somebody else who was there that day. Some people say Rudy and, and, and Chip got both of them. I'm not sure what the full story was on that. Uh, but according to Chip, uh, for all the kids that were there, uh, the alligator ended up uh, uh, being given to the Cincinnati Zoo and taken over and given to the zoo for part of their private collection. But I personally do remember as a kid going through the Behringer Crawford Museum and there always being a stuffed alligator that seemed to have this, you know, hanging on the side of the wall that uh, of all the stuffed animals that were up there, there was this alligator that kind of had a had an ornery look in his eye and was staring at me every time I went through. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the alligator went went there or ended up uh, ended up someplace else. But that is the true story of what happened with the alligators of Prisoners Lake. Yes, if you heard the rumors, they they are rumors of the worst kind. They are true rumors, uh, and they are rumors that uh, again live live to this day, and not only in my family uh, and throughout the Barringer Crawford, but also in my novel Alligator Alley. Uh, so the. One thing I'll, I'll, I'll kind of add as, as the final um, final uh, point today, and then we'll, um, I think we have some time for some questions, uh, is that, you know, this is a picture, a painting that Kevin Kelly did of the road that goes right by uh, Prisoners Lake. By the way, if you uh, want to take a look at some of Kevin Kelly's latest stuff, please go to his Facebook page. Uh, he set up an online store. Uh, where a lot of prints and a lot of canvas and a lot of other things can be bought of his paintings at very at very reasonable prices, uh, but the the whole idea of you know that that today I get to spend my Saturday and Sunday afternoons and mornings sometimes going up to Prisoners Lake with the fly rod, uh, trying to get some of those elusive trout that they drop in there, uh, and still think about the idea of my uncle Chippy and Rudy and Rudy Gaither trying to get an alligator out of the lake. Um, still to this day, when I go up there, it makes me smile and makes and makes uh, uh, makes for a fun morning of going out and trying to fish. Uh, so for anybody that goes up there, you just kind of picture the nose of an alligator popping out of the lake and coming towards you uh, next time or next time you reach down to get a sunfish uh, off a hook. Just remember, there just might be an alligator somewhere somewhere in that lake. Uh, I, I see a lot of comments there, Heather. Do we do we have any do we have some questions that came up? During all of this, um, we had a question on Facebook when you were talking about the depth of the prisoners' lake, and somebody said, "Oh, so they actually did find the bottom?" Like asking whether they found it or not. It, yeah, you know, they. I don't know if the you know again whether whether it's still lore that it is the bottomless lake. I did look on the site for the uh, for the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. And they say it's 26 feet deep. Now, when I go out there and throw a spoon lure out there and let it sink out in the middle, I know it takes a long time for it to go down. So, you know, who knows how, how deep it is. Uh, the, the, the guys who did in that picture that we showed, the, the, the men who did the, the diving, uh, they, I think, were the ones that named it the bottomless lake. Um, 26 feet is pretty deep when you're under dark water. So I, you know, I don't know if they ever did. That is what the, that is what the depth is listed as the, by the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Department. If anybody has anything different, I'm open to listening because I can't imagine a, somehow a quarry only making it 26 feet deep. Seems to me over a time frame when you were running the quarry, it would have gone deeper than that. But that's what the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife says. And then we uh, did have one answer to the uh, trivia question. You can be the judge of whether it's correct or not. But Deb Power said descendants of the Creek and Iamars or Lamars. Very, very good. We're, we're going to give her that one. We're going to, we're going to give her the book. I'm going to drop it off at the museum tomorrow. I'll drop it off for you. You're, 
you're really, really close. It, it's the descendants of, but there's one more in there. Uh, so when Jack, and, and this is kind of one, one of the things you get to do when you write a book is sometimes you will do hours and hours of research for what may be one sentence, one paragraph, not too much that is out there. And I ended up becoming fascinated at the history of the Seminole tribe because there is no indigenous tribe known as the Seminoles. And it's those two tribes of Native Americans plus runaway slaves. So when Andrew Jackson is going down into Florida and trying to, you know, and he was, he was truthfully a sociopath uh, when it came to getting the Native Americans and taking them to Tampa and shipping them across to Galveston to make them walk the Trail of Tears, he was, he was, he was just absolutely fanatical about going into the Everglades and capturing these, these, these Native Americans and these runaway slaves. And there's this beautiful letter, the one of them, not beautiful, but, but very funny letter by, by General Custer, uh, who said, you know, uh, you know there, there are these dinosaurs in the water that are killing our horses and our men. Uh, we don't need to worry about these 400 people that we've chased down to the edge of the, 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 edge of the, the earth because these animals are going to eat them anyway. And so you end up with 400 of the meanest, toughest people, men and women, kids that you could possibly find that, that go down to Southern Florida and end up becoming the Seminoles. And you're right, it was the, the two tribes plus the runaway slaves, a bunch of who then uh, actually uh, um, left the United States and went to Cuba. There's actually a large uh, population of Seminoles in Cuba as well. So. I'm going to give you the answer to that one as being correct. You got two of the three. Uh, a lot of people though, I didn't know about the about the runaway slaves until I actually did the uh, did the background research. So I'm going to declare you the winner. And uh, again, I'll drop off a book at the museum for you. It'll be at the front desk. And if you could, Heather, will um, you get the name to the uh, front desk of who's going to be coming by to pick it up? And if Dad Powers, if you could private message your mailing address to the Barringer Crawford Zoom account on here, that would be great. Anybody else on the chat come up with anything or? I see a bunch of people that came in and uh, I got a cheers from uh, Koenig. Yes, sir, Mark, good to see you. Cheers to you. And uh, so thank you for being here today. I, I appreciate it very much. I appreciate the uh, uh, Barringer Crawford Museum for giving me the opportunity to talk about not only the book, but about the alligators of Prisoner's Lake. And also thank you to the uh, Northern Kentucky Historical Society. Uh, the, the one thing that I do in all of my books, there's always a, always just a, a, a little bit of, a little bit of uh, fact in my fiction. And this is one of those places where it appeared in Alligator Alley when I talk about the, the alligators of Prisoner's Lake. Thank you very much, Heather. Do we have anything else to add? Do we have an endorsement from the Barringer Crawford Museum? Oh, you got to get up and see the trains. Trains oh, are yeah, going to be up soon, do, right? But um, if we, if anybody has any questions, that would be great too. We can do those for a few minutes because we still okay, have some any, time. Anybody else have any questions about uh, about this? I see some folks folks on there. You could actually unmute and ask a question or do it live or doing it through the chat, either way. Heather, I think that, that ends up being a wrap then. Do you have a question, Heather? I don't, unless you want to um, elaborate specifically on why you became an author or specific fishing experiences at Prisoner's Lake? Well, I tell you what, last year they had a really, I, anybody on, I, I hope, if anybody is on here who is a trout fisherman uh, or woman, uh, my next book is actually going to be, uh, that is coming out for Christmas, is going to be called A Fish Ate My Homework, uh, Fly Fishing for Beginners. And we are very, uh, um, one of the things I, I've, I had a lot of fun with is that when I discovered the Prisoner's Lake had trout in them, I uh, was going trout fishing. Now I'll tell you, as when you go up to the Prisoner's Lake, the best place to catch the trout 
uh, is not down by the dam, but if you go up into the corner that kind of runs along the edge of the golf course, uh, that side of the lake, which takes a little bit of hiking to get to, if you're going to go, if you're going to try for the trout, uh, that's one of the places to go. Uh, go to that side, uh, go to the, a little bit of more of the narrow. Uh, weather is going to be perfect right now for, for uh, trout fishing at any of the lakes in Northern Kentucky, where uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife have, have put, put, uh, put trout, which includes uh, over in Campbell County, uh, uh, at the park over uh, the, uh, the park in Southern Campbell County, and uh, Middleton Park has uh, trout in it, Camp Burns has trout in it, uh, uh, and also then in Prisoner's Lake uh, have trout. So all, all these places have rainbow trout. If you're going to go out, the weather's getting, the, the water's getting nice and cool. Trout like to swim around and feed when it's nice and cool. Now's the time to do it. Uh, but uh, if you go up to Prisoner's Lake, go up in that upper, as you as you're, uh, go along the golf course, that par five, you can get on, down on that side and, and get, get, your, get your line out there. That's going to be a perfect place to, to try, try and catch uh, trout. Now, you find a lot of people up there doing catfishing and other stuff, but I, I, I enjoy trying to I just get a kick out of the fact that the place where uh, I used to go as a kid uh, with my dad to, to wet a line was, is now, now has trout. Uh, trophy trout sometime in it so uh if you do that look for me i'll be up there i'll be smoking a cigar you'll be the one with the cigar and a fly fishing line so look me up when you come by and say hi and then mark koenig asked if you need a license to fish in prisoners lake yes you do you do need license to fish in kentucky and if you're going after trout you also need the trout stamp uh so for a kentucky resident i believe it's 30 dollars a year and then you pay an extra ten dollars for the trout stamp. Um, please pay the trout stamp. Please do that because again, uh, the one thing we do well in Kentucky is our fish and wildlife. They do a very good job uh, at making sure that uh, the that the the uh, the hatchery turns out enough fish to take all these local creeks and local ponds uh, and takes them out uh, to do that. So, but yes, you do need you do need a. Uh, you do need a license to fish up with prisoners. Come drop by, Mark. Say hi. I have I have a friend of mine who uh, he and his wife have become fishing guides, and uh, they grew up in Ludlow, and they've become fishing guides in uh, Colorado, and they're coming back simply so the Jim can try and f catch a trout in Prisoners Lake because we. He doesn't believe there's any there, but even though I've sent him pictures. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? We still have about 15 minutes left. Well, with no questions left, then I guess we'll, uh, should we call it a night? Yes, we can. So I we thought... do have Halloween hoopla going on oh, okay. um, at the museum on October 30th from 2 to 4 p.m. at Nature Play. Um, it is family friendly Halloween fun with um, seasonal crafts for kids. They are having a costume parade at 2.30 and reservations are requested, although it is free. So you can call the museum at 859-491-4003 or you can go to the uh, website. And they just added a Madcap puppet performance at Halloween Hoopla um, at 3.30 of Madcap's Legend of Sleep Sleepy Hollow. So be sure to check that out. And when um, did the trains open up? The trains are coming soon, right? The trains are coming usually in november around thanksgiving so they are Love setting the this up now yeah got um, it. they're working on my richard richard has become they, they have become a buy i'm gonna i'm gonna help work on putting the trains up gotta come see the trains guys yeah everyone come see the holiday holiday toy, toy trains um in november when that opens up because that's always a great holiday favorite for everyone um and then I guess that's all we have for this evening. So thank you again to all the sponsors and supporters of BCM. Um, thanks to the staff, trustees, and members of the Banjo Crawford Museum. 
And for more Northern Kentucky history through the week, check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, where you can find the latest installment of Curator Chat with our Curator of Collections, Jason French. Um, please like and subscribe. Uh, there will be not be a Northern Kentucky History Hour next week as we continue our bi-weekly schedule, but we will be back on Wednesday, November 3rd on the Civil War in Boone County with Bridget Stryker of the Boone County Library. Um, until then, take care, everyone, and good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Good to see everybody. Thank you. Hey, Janet, I see your name just popped up. Glad to see you guys.